and your commitment to things. So, yeah, it was basically just kind of like here, have a have a nice little separate bit of pay and uh, a nice title, thanks to your courageous actions. Um, it could be it could be bestowed. It wasn't common, but, but it also wasn't massively uncommon. And the other thing you have to remember is that whilst there is a war degree of friendly rivalry between various armed services, the degree of rivalry between the Royal Marines and the Royal Navy is nothing like the um, <laughs> occasional antipathy, shall we say, between the US Navy and the Marine Corps. I mean, apart from anything, the Royal Marines do generally tend to understand that if they want to go to interesting places and blow them up, they do actually need the Navy for the ride. <laughs> The, the U.S. Marine Corps, on the other hand, seems to have almost, almost its own little air force, its own little army, and its own little navy, so go figure. And although they probably still depend on the U.S. Navy for rides, uh, they probably resent you telling them that. <laughs> Raphael Jazztek, sorry, um, asks, How do Polish Grom-class destroyers compare to other nations' destroyers when they were commissioned and at the end of the war? Complete random side note, and this may just be me being a bit weird, but whenever I see the name uh, Grom class destroyers, I don't know, for some reason mentally I, I want to stand there like an orc at the Battle of the Pelennor Fields, and except instead of yelling Grond, I just want to go Grom, Grom, Grom. Um, I may be dying. Enemy destroyer <laughs> sunk. Anyway. Uh, the, the Grom class, when they are ends in five minutes. commissioned, they're actually pretty Torpedoes, darn powerful. Direct front. Um, they're very heavily armed for destroyers. They're pretty large for destroyers. They're also very fast. Um, they've got decent torpedo set. Mm, looks like what's not to like. Um, they're not perhaps the world's best anti-submarine destroyers, but, well, they're quite obviously fleet destroyers, so that's probably not necessarily... Um, a massive black mark against them. And of course, as with almost all uh, destroyers of the period they commission, Our victory is in sight. The aircraft capabilities, especially in terms of direct self-defense. Um, but again, that's not a massive mark against them, because outside of the US ships lucky enough to be armed with the dual-purpose versions of the 5-inch 38, to a greater or less degree, kind of applies to almost everybody. Our victory is in sight. Um, but yeah, as fleet destroyers, they're certainly they're certainly pretty good top of the line units um, by any estimation. By the end of the war, um, destroyers, generally speaking, had caught up in size, or in cases like the gearings um, and such, like overtaken them. So their armament, very heavy armament at the start of the war, in terms of guns wasn't quite so unusual towards the end of the war, although they were still very well armed. Um, Torpedo-wise, eh, neither here nor there. Um, the torpedo armament was serviceable at the beginning, still serviceable at the end. Obviously they gained a few, well, Liskovica and gained a few um, additional AA guns over the course of time, and of course was also refitted with dual 4-inch guns, which slightly lessened the anti-surface fire power even though they gained an extra gun, um, but did mean that its and the aircraft capabilities increased quite dramatically. So, I mean, the, the, the main thing is that any destroyer that was in active service in most navies um, at the beginning of the war, it was going to